Welcome everyone to another edition of our interactions and conversations with inspiring women who have lipedema. I read this woman's story today and I couldn't help but get a little teary-eyed. At age 30, she was in a nursing home and today she is full of life and inspiring other people on her website and on her Facebook page. She is, well, let me let her introduce Angelique Charles. How are, are you also known? The Lippy Butterfly. <laughs> Thank the you Lippy so much. Butterfly is with us today, and I'm so delighted. Tell me about the name Lippy Butterfly. Where did that come from? The Libby Butterfly came from um, basically a huge fear that I have of butterflies. Um, okay. So as a child, I was sitting outside one day and I swear a butterfly came by and pinched me on the arm. And from then I, I acquired this huge fear of butterflies, but I also found them absolutely beautiful. So when I thought about tackling my journey of lipedema, a lot of the things that happened along the way were a result of me succumbing to my fear as opposed to trying to just work through everything in order to get to the beauty of, of things. So Lippy Butterfly is my journey of actually overcoming my fears and difficulties in order to try to reach what I really want in life. And you are doing it. And I'm telling you, everybody, buckle your seatbelts because wait till you hear her journey, which started back when you were a little girl, right? I did. Um, in talking with my mom, um, she says that she didn't understand how a little girl could have cellulite at such a young age, but she noticed that the formation of my fat just looked rather different. And um, I was rather large as a child. I was over 300 pounds by the age of 12. Um, most of it was carried in my lower body. Um, in I just, no matter what I did, it felt like I just could not lose it. I was a very active child. I worked in basketball camps. I was on the dance team. I also taught dance, even in my young adult years, at four and 500 pounds, um, still trying to, like, do things. So I was trying to be active, but it seemed like no matter what diets we tried, exercises and all of those things, it didn't seem like it was working for me. Um, and the only answers that the doctors could give most of the time, even in my teens, was just to have weight loss surgery. All right, so I, to some small degree, can relate. I was the only child in kindergarten that was on a thousand calorie a day diet. My yeah. mom had to pack cra unsalted crackers and like dried fruit for my yeah. lunch while the other kids were eating Oreos because I was a hundred pounds in kindergarten. Yeah. And I, you know, there's that disconnect. I'm not like the other kids. Always. It always felt like that. I remember it's likewise um, on Sunday days, we would pack a rice crackers in my lunch bag and it would so, somewhat be embarrassing that the other kids were able to eat candy and I wasn't necessarily able to do that but the other kids were also able to run pretty fast and I wasn't able to do that so I just kind of growing up I tried to just weigh it out and say okay well I have to do things differently because I'm larger but inside I felt like why can they eat the candy bar and I can't and I felt I know this is not about me but that my mom put me on a diet, made me feel like she didn't see me as okay because yeah. I wasn't the same size as everyone else. Like, Absolutely. I always was fighting this feeling of not being good enough Absolutely. as a result. I had a distinct um, conversation with my mom one time and almost passively aggressively said to her, you know, I'm sorry that I embarrass you everywhere you go because I'm so large, you know? And she was saying, you know, it wasn't that it was an embarrassment, but she was concerned about what was going on. But in my mind, because it was her that was instructing me to make changes, I felt like she didn't appreciate that fact that I was just myself. Yes, I, I felt it as a rejection, even though it wasn't truly that in my case, but I feel you. And yet, so here you are, age 12, 300 pounds, close to 400 by age 18. And then you said something and you just broke and you just said, I'm not going to try anymore. No, I got to the point where I felt like I don't love myself. So... 
I'm going to try to love myself by comforting myself. I'm not going to put these pressures on myself anymore. I'm going to just accept me for who I am and hope that the world accepts me for who I am as well. Um, and for the most part, the world did accept me for who I am. My friends, my sisters, all of them still loved me, but that wasn't really what was going on. It was me at that point giving up, but by saying, I'm just going to accept who I am. So in all honesty, there was something deeper that you needed to come to. And, yeah, absolutely. You know, you posted something on your Facebook page and it just got me. And I think it's going to touch everybody out there. It was a quote and it said, and I said to my body softly, I want to be your friend. It took a long breath, replied, I have been waiting my whole life for this. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. When I read that quote, as a matter of fact, my best friend um, sent that quote to me, um, and she said, this reminds me of you. That was at the point that I had started saying, it's me that needs to make the change. It's me that, this is after um, weight loss surgery and all of that happened. Oh, and we, we don't want to buy, we don't want to buy, <laughs> that's pun intended, right? We right. Don't but this is. This is more recently that I actually got to that point of being able to say, you know what, it's me that has to actually care about me by putting nutritious things into my body, by being active, by finding out what it is that's going to help me. Because it felt like even the doctors weren't helping as much as they were just judging. And a lot of times... Uh, not of their own fault, but they really just didn't know. So it was up to me to love me enough to say, hey, what do you need today, body? What nourishment do you need today? Not what would you like, but what will make you better? And then I did notice my body turning around and going, thank you. Mm. Thank you. When I started drinking water instead of soda, my mm. body was like, thank you. Thank you so much. Little things like that, little whispers to say, hey, I, I actually care about you, Angelique. I'm not waiting for someone else to care about you. I I'm actually really care about you. so glad and grateful that you didn't stay shut down because mm. when you speak, there's such grace and power. Even the way you phrase words, when I read your your biography and and shout out to my friend Cheryl Scolage from Food and yes. Influences, the Lipedema page who introduced us. She's awesome, right? Thank you so I, much. I know. And I, as soon as I read your story, I thought, wow, she, there's a book in you at least, if not Thank much you. more, but the way you phrase things like there were whispers and, you know, just have a beautiful way of speaking. So I want to go back to this story of yours and at age 25, you had taken some airplane trips. I did. What triggered from, from those experiences? You know, um, at age 25, I went to both the Bahamas and shortly after returning, my grandmother passed um, in Indianapolis. So I had to take another trip. Um, and they were, you know, just a few months apart, um, but it should have been enough time for my body to recover. After the second trip, though, once I got back, I noticed that um, what used to be lumpy, tight fat had now turned into very lumpy, nodulely, hard, and painful fat. Um, so at the time, I used to sit with one leg on the bed quite often, and that was the leg that was affected the most at that time, which we're talking about a patch about this size, not very big. Um, so I could just rub it out. But every day after work, at the time I was working overnight shift. Mm -hmm. um, so at the time, um, about six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning, I would rub my leg for a few hours to alleviate it and go to sleep after that. Um, but that continued to intensify and grow and become these rock hard boulders. Um, probably within about two to three years after that, it just progressed. And even when you were dieting, and we know this about lipedema, you can diet and exercise all day long with no impact, but you were actually noticing your upper body reducing. Yes. And your lower body was 
getting larger. How frustrating is that? Well, once we get into the weight loss surgery portion of it, it gets to be really dramatic. Um, the weight loss there was, it was ridiculously um, asymmetrical. It was, it was definitely very much larger on top, very much smaller on the bottom. I lost almost 200 pounds in my upper body but my lower body continued to get larger, more painful. It was harder for me to walk. Um, at that time, I was still trying to work, but um, I had to have a friend actually take me to work because I couldn't get up the step to get into my job. Some of my employees were helping me to the bathroom, um, oh. like just trying to help me continue to function because I didn't want to quit working. I didn't really know what to do. This was, you know, what do you say? I need to quit because I am too large to work. That doesn't feel too good. Um, so, so and mentally, I was still okay. So I felt like I could still function, but physically, I couldn't function. I couldn't. Um, at one point, the reason why I stopped driving was because my legs had grew so large that I couldn't even reach the brake pedal fast enough. So you're watching and experiencing your body sort of rebel against you and all your best efforts. And we always say in these interviews, we're not offering any medical advice here. We're not medical professionals or healthcare professionals. We just are sharing journeys so that maybe we can keep some of you out there watching from making mistakes or staying determined to get a proper diagnosis so you can get the help you really need. Because you went to your doctor and said, I think this is lymphedema. lymphedema. I went to several doctors, not just one. I went to several doctors and said, because I did the research on my own. I said, you know, there has to be other people out there that have this swelling condition. It can't just be me. Uh, the thing that came up at that time over and over again was lymphedema. Um, so I went to my doctor at that time and said, is this lymphedema? They said no, so I switched doctors and <laughs> asked someone else. I went to an innovative primary care thinking they would have more information on progressive diseases, things that people don't really know about. Right. Um, but they said um, this couldn't be lymphedema because I had it on both sides, which didn't actually even make sense for lymphedema. But their the medical community really doesn't have a lot of information about it unless they've spent a lot of time studying the lymphatic system or fat diseases or something like that. So you were told that the issue was cellulitis? At one point, I was told that I had cellulitis and I got treated for that. Another point, I was told that I had a blood clot and got treated for that. But later on, um, after the swelling in my legs, a lot of the fibrotic tissue started to decrease. Mm -hmm. They came back and they said that there was never a blood clot there. They just assumed that there was one because there was unexplained swelling. Wow. So then... I don't, if I'm fast forwarding too quickly, let me know. But at age 30, you had the gastric, is it called a plication? Yes. So I didn't want to go as invasive as the gastric bypass because um, I had heard a lot of things about malnutrition with that and I was already a little bit concerned. So um, the gastric plication was um, a new surgery that they were kind of trying out at the time. It would be like making your stomach into a sleeve without removing any of the stomach. So they fold it and then just basically sew it up. And they basically from that point, it should be pretty reversible. Um, but I still ended up dealing with malnutrition issues and um, other issues. I, I ended up becoming severely anemic and um, very malnutrition, even though at the time that they said that I was eating a donut, well, half a donut every day for breakfast, because I was just depressed. <laughs> sure, yeah, there, there are times when mentally, I just need a cookie. Yeah, that's how I felt at the time. I, I get it, and especially <laughs> when you're trying so hard. And what I saw in your story is every time you were searching, searching, searching for answers, every time you were like, I think this is it. I got it. Yay. My Yay. new life is about to begin. And boom, every single time, every single time. It's, the surgery is probably one of the bigger ones because 
I thought for certain, okay, everybody has said the only way to get rid of these huge bulges on my legs is to just have weight loss surgery. And I had determined that I wasn't really going to take that route, but I finally went ahead and convinced myself that this was the only thing that would possibly help me. And it was fun to watch my upper body, you know, lose weight and stuff, but it was devastating to still have trouble walking. And that was one of the biggest factors that got me to change my mind. I was already struggling to get up curves a little bit. I was already struggling to want to walk through the grocery store. I was already struggling to even want to walk around the office at work. So to me, at the time, I had also lost my job. I was struggling to want to go on job interviews, not only for difficulty walking, but just sheer embarrassment. So I used the weight loss surgery as a little bit of a confidence boost to allow me to get the next job. And it was fun watching the upper body weight come down. But the difficulty of watching my lower body continue to get larger, even after having gone through all of that, I was mad, to be honest. That's why I was eating half of a donut, because it was like I couldn't even get in a whole burger, but I also couldn't walk. So it was like it was, I, do, I was defeated in what I was trying to do in order to help myself. I absolutely hear you, and I, I feel for you. So then finally you get to the point where you get the lymphedema diagnosis. Yes. And yet, still, the person who diagnosed you said, we don't know much about it. So you're smart. Go figure it out, basically. That story gets to be a little bit more fun than that, even. Really? Um, yes. So that doctor said to me, um, you know, this is lymphedema, but I don't know much about it. You're a smart girl. You need to go and figure it out. So I did. I went back and I researched for about two months and I found four locations in the valley that treated lymphedema and I thought, hey, let's figure out which one gives the most modalities for this and get the most bang for our buck. So I figured out which one to go to, which was literally a, um, not that far. It was called the lymphedema, um, the lymphedema treatment center at Scottsdale Healthcare. And um, I went to go get the referral to go there, and my doctor was out of town. The doctor that I was seeing, the first thing that she said was, there's no cure for lymphedema. And I said, you're correct. There is no cure for lymphedema, but there are treatment options that, I, that will help me to get some relief, and all I need you to do is send a referral for me. And she goes, there's no treatment for lymphedema. And I go, well, ma'am, there is treatment for it, you know, even though there's no cure, but I would like to at least try to get seen by the people that can maybe help me. And she goes, where do you want me to send this referral? And I go, to the lymphedema treatment center at the Scottsdale Healthcare Center. She looks through the computer, she pretends like she can't find it. And I ended up having to the send referral myself. She was so angry to find out that there was actually treatment for lymphedema that she stormed out of the room and refused to prescribe me my pain meds that I needed. Oh my goodness. It's, it's actually shocking. It's piling on pain to the pain you're dealing with with your physical condition. It's been, that is just one experience with the doctors in the community, um, whether it was talking about lymphedema or lipedema, um, the lack of knowledge in the medical community has made getting treatment very difficult. Even if we're talking about um, wrapping my legs when I was in um, SNFs or long-term facilities, it was difficult getting wrapped. Um, it was difficult getting any of the prescribed things that actually help with the condition, even as far as dietary needs that I had, which at times were difficult, um, just because of a lack of knowledge in the medical community in regards to lipedema and lymphedema. So I started out this interview by announcing you as a woman who at age 30 was in basically a nursing home. Is this the point we're at now in the story? That's pretty much where we have gotten to. <laughs> so you end up there. Well, we're not there yet. At one point, so after the diagnosis of lymphedema, um, things were progressing. I finally got into um, treatment for that. One month in, I lost my mobility. 
<laughs> it's like every time I thought I was climbing out of it, um, something else Ooh. came along. So I got a really bad UTI infection one month into the lymphedema care. And I ended up in the hospital. Um, and after three days of not being able to stand up, I li literally couldn't even get on my feet at all. Um, so I ended up going to, excuse me, my first rehab facility. Um, but again, there was an open window there because of all of the places that they could have sent me, I went to the one place that had a lymphedema person as their director. So the lymphedema director um, as like an extra benefit for me would come in after her shift was over just to wrap my legs in exchange for taking me down to the front lobby to play the piano for the residents in the afternoon. So it was kind of like a give and a give. That's beautiful. So it was fun, actually. It helped me to get through that time. My mom is also a musician, so and my mom was here visiting at the time as well. So both of us gave a little mini concert at the um, facility in the afternoons in exchange for me being able to get wrapped. And by that, I was able to lose a lot of my bulk in the two months that I was there. Um, I was able to that's when I actually reached the 200 pound um, decrease. So I had probably lost a good 50 pounds or so wow. in the two months that I was there at the facility, just because she was willing to stay there. She also kinesio taped me and did a little bit of MLD and taught my mom to do a little bit of MLD to help me to progress at that point. And they gave us enough tips that I was able to maintain that for a little while after I got home. And you met someone who calls herself a lymphomaniac, Dr. Andrea Brennan. Now, yes. where does she fit into this story? So about two years after the first short-term um, facility stay, I broke my ankle. I was progressing pretty good. Oh, I had gone, speak. I had started traveling again and everything. I thought I was really on my way. And going to the restroom one night, I just turned my ankle in a crazy way and broke it. I ended up in the facility, um, in one facility that said that they couldn't accommodate me because of my size. Um, but this facility that Andrea Brennan was, is at um, said that they were able to take me and they had a lot of information in lymphedema and it was a complete lifesaver just meeting her. I love that it saved your life. I keep hearing that song in my head. Do you remember it from years ago? I get knocked down, but I yes. get up. Again. I get knocked down. <laughs> it seems like that's your story. You got knocked down, but you kept getting up again. Now you then ended up after meeting Dr. Brennan, bedridden. It still didn't end. It still didn't end bedridden there for two months. Are yes. you, this is the first time I believe, though, that you heard the term lipo lymphedema. Right. So. I ended up meeting Dr. Brennan there. Um, unfortunately, she was out of town the majority of my stay there, but I met her the last day that I had, and she gave me the diagnosis of lipolymphedema. And I told her at that meeting, I had been hearing about lipedema, but since I hadn't really looked into it that much, I didn't know how much it met up with what I had. Um, one of the things at that time that um, had me a little bit confused was that they speak of like a characteristic um, ankle ring, and my ankles are a little bit smaller than um, what that is. My lipedema actually starts more in my calf area and then balloons once it gets up to my thighs and hips and buttocks area, not very much in the panis area. Um, but at that time, I didn't even know that there were different types of lip lipedema or anything about it, you know, that far. So she told me, yes, indeed, this is lipedema that has progressed so much that you also have lymphedema on top of it. Um, she goes, you're going to have, you know, a lot of the same modalities in order to treat it or whatever, but continue looking at the lipedema stuff, and we're going to try to fight to get you some more time here, which they weren't able to do. Insurance then came into play, or the lack of coverage, and so you needed to go back, you, you right. couldn't stay there for your treatment. Right, you know, they sent me home, current, at the time, swelling, 
Um, so within, I got home around May, May 20th or so. Um, by July, I couldn't get out of the bed. I couldn't get out of the hospital bed that was in our living room. It was just think, no standing. Did you think your life was over? I did to a certain extent. I, I, I was embarrassed and I didn't know what could help. Um, but again, there was like this short a glimmer of hope. Um, I was able to get all Texas insurance, um, which is a long-term care insurance out here, which allows you to spend more time in facilities. Um, so it was like, here's a grand opening for me to actually stay in a facility until I get all of the actual help that I need to get on my feet and be mobile. Um, but the facility that Andrew was at is not one that was available through that insurance. They sent me to a, a facility that's about two hours from my house in Tucson. Um, and I think that's the point where things started to feel like my life was just completely over. Well, because you were separated from your support system too. Absolutely, yeah. But you were super committed to get, th this is the message I want everybody to hear because this is not about glorifying the drama or the pain or the, the valleys of Angelique's life. This is to say, if you are in a valley and have felt this way, hang on. Hang on. This too shall pass because if you are resilient and you keep fighting, if you keep getting up when you're knocked down, there can be a very happy ending at the at the end of that story and light at the end of the tunnel. So you're hours away from your support system and your sisters were very key to yes. giving you a deadline. Yes. Tell me what uh, they I, I had originally gone down there for what was supposed to be just three to four months and a year passed by. Um, I got sick while I was there. I actually did contract cellulitis while I was down mm -hmm. there. Um, and so at a certain point, the doctors just said, you know what, we don't have lymphedema care down here. You need to get back up to the valley. And it didn't seem like it was something that was really feasible, but I knew that it was something that was going to have to happen. Um, but my sisters came down after I got out of the hospital the second time and they said, enough is enough. Like you need to come home. You have until May to get home. And I believe this was close to December when they said that, but there was something about that, that just, it felt like there was something that was going on at the time. Anyway, um, my sister was expecting and I was really wanting to be around for the baby. Um, she subsequently had a miscarriage, unfortunately, but that did give me the vigor that I needed to push because I wanted to be here. I wanted to be at my home when the baby got here. Um, and a lot of other things happened along the way that where the doors just started to open up. Once I had it in my mind that I was just, I'm going home. I'm going um, home. That's I'm it. Going <laughs> I am going home. Um, the therapist started to work in the vein of me going home, which was quite different. Um, and so it seems like my distances with walking started to get longer and my stamina was staying up, started to get longer. My focus was completely different. Um, and everything just started to open up, even as far as going back to seeing Andrea Brennan again. The door opened up. Um, the doctor that I had there previously said, yes, we absolutely want her back. Bring her here. And oh, they wow. were opened arms waiting for me to get back. The name had changed, but the people were still there and waiting to help and give all of the support and all of the new information that had came out over the two years since, uh, since I had left. That's one of the exciting things, that this condition is being researched more than ever and new information comes out and new techniques and new therapies. It's Absolutely. Awesome. I love what you said in your story. What a sigh of relief to be back in a place that understood my body. Yes. 
yes i can't even explain to you what it felt like even the first time that i was there but more so the second time that i was there and um in particularly andrea spent time talking to me while she worked on me while i was there and she really encouraged me to look at my eating differently and this was kind of the first time that I was able to hear it and receive it in a different vein. It wasn't a judgmental, why don't you diet? Why don't you cut your calories? You, you know, I, I would get offended when people would say, why don't you cut your calories? Because at that point, I couldn't even eat a whole burger. So why don't you cut your calories? That's how I felt a lot of times. But instead sure. of presenting um, the idea of changing how I ate, in a manner like that, Andrea presented it as an understanding of how my body functioned and was saying, you know, these are the things that you might want to look at, but also just cutting carbs might not work for you. you your body might need the healthier grains to be introduced. Um, trying to do high protein might not necessarily be great for if you're using red meat and things like that. You might need to look at desaturating some of that fat from the red meats and getting your proteins from other places. But looking at how lipedema affects your body and changing your mindset on eating is, is kind of what started changing my focus. So it really was a sigh of relief. It was a breath of fresh air to be in a place with people that understood that there was a condition going on and they were excited about helping me with the condition. And also empowering you to take charge of Absolutely. whatever you can do to help you, which is great. That means you're not a victim. No. You can take charge of certain things. And you have, when I look at your Facebook page, and I encourage everybody to follow the lippy butterfly, because it's really inspirational in nature. But I see a lot of healthy eating options and things that you're doing to inspire others and say, oh, well, she can cook that. I can cook that too. And, you know, were you yes. always, did you always like to cook or is this something new? <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not. Um, part of what contributes to my obesity, not the lipedema part of it, but part of what contributes to my obesity is the fact that I never cooked. Um, I, when I worked, I ate out every single day. Um, there was never any groceries for me at my house. Even when um, I decided to live with my older sister, the refrigerator was full of her food, absolutely none of mine. Um, and then it just became harder and harder to cook. I can cook well, but it just became harder and harder to do it. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that was kind of important to me once I decided that I really did want to make a change was I needed to be in charge of what went into my body. And also, I wanted to just use it as physical activity because I didn't do anything for myself, not my laundry, um, not vacuuming, not changing my bed clothes or, you know, any of the actual important things. So it seemed like cooking would be an easy way for me to start gaining a little bit of independence. Um, so I started off trying to find easy recipes that weren't going to cost me a lot of energy in my body because it was still hard for me to stand. I still have difficulty with balancing and things like that. I still have limited time on my feet. So I needed things that I could kind of chop up while I'm practicing my chopping skills and throw in a pan or throw in the crock pot and then five hours later, it's done. So there's a lot of crock pot meals that I started working on. But even here recently, I started working on a few more intricate meals than that, that are more clean. I'm trying to keep um, out the heavy carbs and starches and sh definitely sugars and um, soy and things like that. But I'm still molding what it is that I feel works for me. So at this time, I'm posting up what I'm working on that's working and as I'm growing and hoping that it progresses as I go. Well, what is happening is people are paying attention and recognizing you. And we were talking about the importance of the lipedema community and how open-hearted 
these women are. It's not like, you know, oh, here's the new new one in town. No, everybody's like, come Absolutely. on in. You got a story to share. We want to hear it. And there is that support and that synergy there. So that's beautiful. I I love what you said. Love your legs for what they can do, not for how they look. Man. Powerful I, stuff. I spent so many years um especially in my teen years, trying to shape my legs. I wanted them to look like my friend's legs, or even when I noticed that my legs were just going to be bigger than other people's, I wanted them to not be lumpy or not be hard because it looked bad. Mm -hmm. um, but I started trying to focus on, you can actually stand, Angelique, because that's something that I wasn't able to do for a period of time. You can walk walk further, push yourself just a little bit further, do a few more squats so that you your legs can actually be strong to carry out the things that you want to do, like dance or sing or whatever it is that you're wanting to do. Use your legs for that and stop just focusing on the looks of it. Because you're never really going to be satisfied with the looks of everything if that's all you're going for. You have to be satisfied with what you're able to do, what your character is by utilizing your legs. And dance you did at your <laughs> birthday party. You know, her sisters had said, you're coming home by such and such a date. And it also wrapped around your birthday. Yes. And there was a video you posted and you were, you were dancing and it brought such joy to even watch that. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but what, what's your message to the lipedema ladies out there who are either looking to be diagnosed, they may be a little discouraged, they've gotten knocked down and are weary of getting up again. What would you say to them? In my darkest hour, um, one of the best words of advice um, that came to me came from a friend of mine um, that is a physical trainer. And what he said was, Allow yourself to have a bad day, but don't allow yourself to have two in a row. And that was one of the things that actually just encouraged me to keep going because lipedema can be really hard on you emotionally. It's hard to explain to people a disease that looks like it's your fault, even though it's not. Um, it, it's very lonely at times, very painful at times. Um, and so bad days are going to come. You can't beat yourself up about the bad days. But what you tell yourself is, tomorrow, I'm going to do something for me. Something that's going to make me better. Whether it's I'm going to spend 30 minutes doing yoga. I'm going to eat healthy tomorrow. I'm going to do a goal planner anything that it is that's going to elevate where you're at on that bad day, do that the next day. Have your ice cream day, have your donut that one day, but don't let it carry on for multiple days. Pick yourself up the next day and keep going forward. You say that the lippy butterfly is not about you having arrived, but it's about your journey. And I think that we all are privileged to know you and excited to follow your journey. Angelique. Thank you so um, much. What a joy it was to talk to you. You're super special. It was a pleasure talking to you too. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us. And we will continue to bring you stories from fabulous lipedema women who want to inspire. And if you know of someone that would make a great interview, shoot me an email. I would love to hear from you and to talk to them. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, Angelique. Bye, and thank you so much. See ya.